Oh, hi everyone, welcome to the program, Pathways of Service. I'm Paul Perry, Director of Education for the Museum. I want to thank the Office of the Director's Action Group for working with the Education Department to put this program on today, and also to Naval District Washington, DEI Office, for their logistical support. And of course, to our panelists for taking time from their regular day jobs to be here today to support not just Naval History and Heritage Command's recognition, but the nation's recognition of Black History Month 2024. This program is being recorded, so I do ask that cell phones be muted or turned off while the program is in progress. Those of you who have not been here before, restrooms are towards the front of the museum, adjacent to the museum store. And please take a few moments after the program to walk around the museum and take a look at the exhibitry that we have up, and also to check out the concept panels uh, that were made depicting what the future National Museum of the U.S. Navy might look like. So we'll go ahead and kick the program off now. Denise? Yes. So, hi. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Denise Krupp. Can you guys hear me? It's always yes. a good thing. First thing you ask is, can you hear me? Okay. So, hi. For folks here in the room, but also the folks that are going to be watching this afterwards, we're at the National Museum of the United States Navy. And this month is African American History Month. And in preparation for this month, I called up some friends of mine and I said, hey, you know what? We're going to have a panel discussion and I want you to be on this panel. So I'm going to introduce some amazing, amazing people. And by the way, we have a substitute, so I will explain this too. As Paul says, put the microphone in your face, Denise. Okay, <clears throat> so to my immediate left is Lori. I'm going to explain John here in a second. And Lori is a 20-year Navy veteran and a retired Navy commander. Her last assignment was at the Pentagon, serving as both the Director of Administration for the Director of Navy Staff and as the Director for the Navy's Performance to Plan Program, now known as the Navy Problem Solving Office. Her other active duty assignments included Operations, Oper operations Officer, USS Underwood, and the Executive Officer of the USS We City. She is a graduate of Spelman College and was commissioned through the Morehouse College Naval Reserve Officer Training Corps. But what's not in here is Lori's an Army brat. So we're going to get to that in just a second. And I say that as being an Army brat. How did an Army brat end up in the Navy? So we're going to get there in a few minutes. All right. Now another friend of mine, I called up and I was like, all right, Keith, you got to come in. This is Lieutenant Commander Reuben Keith Green, is a retired Naval Surface Warfare Officer who served 22 years in the Atlantic Fleet from 1975 to 1977. His enlisted tours were as a mineman, a legal yeoman, an equal opportunity program specialist, and an administrative office leading petty officer. And then he became a commissioned officer via the Officer Candidate School in 1984, where he served as a commissioned officer tour as a communications officer, CMS custodian, and four department head tours as an engineer officer aboard the USS Boone, EXO among, on the USS Gemini, import training officer on Desron 8, and a base telephone operations facilities director. He wrote a book, and we're going to be talking about his book today, entitled Black Officer, White Navy. It's published by the University of Kentucky Press, and it's scheduled for release in June of 2024. Now, another friend I called up, his name is Lieutenant Gerald Collins. Gerald wrote a book we're going to talk about as well. Gerald's a military and federal government retiree. Okay, but before we get to retiree, he had an amazing career in the Navy. He served as both enlisted and as officer. And then he went on to hold leadership positions in the Federal Emergency Management Agency, Catholic Charities, USA, the Red, uh, American National Red Cross. And, um, then he did something else. He left, the, he became an ordained deacon in the Archdiocese of Washington, D.C. And he was assigned to his home parish, the Holy Family in Hillcrest Heights, Maryland. And in 2006, he relocated to Atlanta, Georgia. And he wrote a book that we're gonna talk about today called In the Shadow of the Golden Thirteen, A Nice Inn Story. So we've got two different books we're gonna be talking about today. Now we were supposed to have <coughs> Rear Admiral St. Harris was supposed to be joining us, and he called me up last week and he said, hey Denise, I can't come. I was like, okay, so now down to three. And then Keith 
And John called me and he said, hey, wait a second, Denise. I want to have John on here because Keith and John have been doing some pretty amazing things on the publishing world. And so we're going to talk about that. So now I get to talk about John, who's a 1984 graduate of the US Naval Academy. And he got his doctorate of engineering management with a focus on human systems integration from Old Dominion University. All right. He's also, you know, CEO of a ship. So there we go. But that's why we have John, because of the work he's doing with Keith. Now we got to get to the topic today. Pathways of service. And what I'm hoping you guys would start out with today is tell us about your pathway in the United States Navy and who puts you on that pathway. So Lori, if you wouldn't mind starting. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming out. Um, I feel like that was a complete setup, thanks to Denise. Um, right, so yes, I am an Army brat. Um, my dad did 31 years um, in the Army, um, and he actually gave me my first salute when I was commissioned as an officer. So my father was enlisted. Um, I asked him to give me my first salute when I was commissioned, um, and he also gave me my last salute when I retired six months ago. Um, so. With that, I would say, honestly, it was, it was probably my dad who put me on that path. Um, but not so much put me on the path like you will grow up and you will join the military. Um, I come from a very large family of military servicemen and women. Um, my grandmother was in World War II, where she met my grandfather. Um, there is a picture floating around, I'm not sure which cousin has it now, um, of a black woman who did some service during the Civil War as well. Um, so just kind of growing up with that background um, and knowing that I came from a family of service, I just always felt like that is what I was destined to do. Uh, so we started out, um, one of my earliest military memories, like directly tied to the military, was actually watching assault at West Point way back in the 80s. Um, and so at that point, I was like, hey, that, that West Point seems kind of cool. Not that the story is very historical and accurate um, and important, but not what happened to the first black graduate of West Point, but just being a cadet at West Point really struck me. Um, and I was too young to understand that West Point actually meant becoming an officer in the movie. But I said, you know what, Dad? I'm going to West Point. And he was like, OK, I guess you're going to West Point. So we did kind of start, you know, prepping to go to a military academy. Um, but at the last minute, I was like, oh, oh, Dad's a command sergeant major now. Oh, I don't know if I want to go to another school where they're going to have complete control over my life until I graduate, because uh, Daddy's been doing a good job of that for 18 years, right? <laughs> uh, so I decided that I wanted to go to college, um, but I still knew that I wanted to serve. Uh, so, in an effort to just make him very angry, I decided to join the Navy. No, I'm kidding. That was a complete joke. Uh, the truth of the matter is, I had um, an opportunity to go Army ROTC or Navy ROTC. Um, at the time, and it's been well over two decades, so it may have updated, but back then the Army would pay for two years of college, um, and the Navy would pay for my entire time. And I went to Spelman College, which was a little expensive, so I went with the four-year option as opposed to the two-year option. Um, but a conversation that my father and I recently had, you know, he said, I did however many years he did in the Army, and you have been to more places and have done more and have seen more in the Navy than I could have ever imagined. Um, so that was, that was really special to me. Um, and I carry him in my heart. Every time I would serve, I carried a picture of my grandmother on every deployment that I ever went on, um, just to kind of remind me, you know, why I'm out here and why I'm doing what I'm doing. Thank you. Uh, you're not the only um, person with military lineage. We've got two more down there. All right. Keith, you want to talk about uh, your, your, your pathway? Because I know you, you come from Navy. Yes, I do. Uh, Thank you for inviting me, and I'm happy to be here. Uh, my father was in the Navy. My grandfather was in the Army. Uh, my pathway to service uh, came directly from Admiral uh, Zumwalt, the CNO from the 70s. Uh, 
My father discouraged me from joining the Navy because he'd had some bad experiences. Uh, but I was an avid reader. I read encyclopedias. I read, you know, Ebony and Jet magazine. And I loved the snazzy uniforms on the Navy guys in the, uh, in the encyclopedias. But I noticed there weren't any black people wearing those. And so um, once I learned about Admiral Zumwalt, he, uh, in the 70s, he said, there's no black Navy, there's no white Navy, there's just one Navy. So I said, well, this guy's smarter than my father. I'm going to go ahead and join the Navy and find out. So I came in the Navy as a lineman, uh, four by six reserve, which meant I went to A school and uh, boot camp in A school, and then I went into the reserves. I figured if it was going to be as bad as my father said it was, I could put up with it uh, one weekend a month. But I wound up doing pretty well in A school. We started out with uh, maybe 28 people, and only seven of us graduated. I was number two in my class. I was the youngest person in the class and also the only high school dropout, uh, and also the only black uh, student in the class. So uh, I demonstrated some aptitude pretty early on for, uh, for, for naval service. Wound up doing um, nine and a half years as an enlisted guy. I was right at the nine and a half year point. I, I made first class early, which nobody expected me to do because I uh, studied the rate training manual stuff so well that I uh, could uh, state the answer to the test in my sleep. <laughs> so, but I wound up getting promoted to E6 early, applied for the limited duty officer program, told I was uh, senior enough to apply, but too junior to get selected. Applied for the enlisted commissioning program, and I uh, wasn't selected for that. So meanwhile, I worked uh, in my spare time getting my bachelor's degree, and finally, finished up my bachelor's degree in 1983, and applied for OCS. Had I not been selected, I was going to work for IBM did an internship with them and the guy that was running their entry-level marketing program said, I want you to come work for us. And I said, well, who makes a decision if I get uh, selected for the job? And he said, I do. So I gave the Navy one more shot. And uh, wisely or unwisely, they selected me and sent me to officer candidate school. So after that, I, I hit the ground running. I had to, uh, a lot of ground to make up so that I could make Admiral on time. So <laughs> I wound up doing a one division officer tour. Uh, I was a communications officer, but I wanted to get my engineering ticket punched as well, which was a little difficult to do. So I wound up going down in the engineering plant, uh, qualified as a 1,200-pound steam engineer on one of the last ships in the uh, Navy uh, that still had a steam plant. And I thought that was just going to help me get promoted. Instead, it got me assigned to the um, I went to department in school after that tour. And uh, there were two classes, uh, slates of classes. There was one ship nobody wanted. That was the USS Boone out of Bayport. It was just coming out of a 13-month overhaul. Two weeks after that, it was going to refresher training in Guantanamo Bay. And then a few months after that, it was deploying to the Persian Gulf. Uh, well, guess who got that job? It was a job nobody wanted. I was a junior person in uh, both classes. And I'd never served a day in an engineering department. So I went from first class yeoman to chief engineer on a frigate as a frock lieutenant in four years. If anybody else has done that, I sure would like to meet it because it had to be just as hard as what I did. So wound up spending uh, uh, all of that, three back-to-back -back sea tours, lots of sea time, lots of uh, uh, lack of sleep, and then I wound up going to uh, my first shore tour, um, and that was where my career started going sideways. I wrote a book about that. I probably uh, would have stayed in the Navy another 10 years or so, eight, eight or 10 years or so. Uh, but every now and then you'll run into a snag, and I hit one of them. So after stewing on it for about 20 years, I decided to write a book about it. And anybody who knows me will tell you will, that I will tell anybody that's uh, uh, had any sorts of life experiences at all, write your story down and tell it. Because if, it, if I hadn't told my story, I wouldn't be sitting on this stage, and uh, I wouldn't have the connections that I have now. Gentlemen on this panel did wrote as well. And, and Gerald, do you want to talk about how you came in and, and uh, a little bit about oops, a little bit about your book? Yes, I will. Uh, again, as the other panelists said, thank you for having us here. Uh, I thought I was the glutton for punishment, but hearing his story, I knew enough to know that I wanted nothing at all to do with the steam plant, steam cycle, and all of that. But my story, I digress. My story is. Uh, I came out of a family where my mother, my mother used to work. Uh, she started out working in the Department of Labor. She went from the Department of Labor to the Navy where she was uh, 
she was one of the ladies who were clerks, basically, who, who assisted uh, the officers as they came in to review their service records at View Curves. Uh, at that time, they would have black women go and escort black officers, and they had white women go and escort white officers. And my mother used to talk about how impressed she was with the men who came in wearing the gold. And that sort of sparked you know, my interest in the officer corps generally. But then my oldest brother joined the Navy, and um, he retired as a senior chief. And uh, to be honest with you, he was a boiler technician, BT. So he was very instrumental in getting me through the whole steam plant thing. This is why I said he's a glutton for punishment. My route to, to my commission, um, when I was enlisted, I thoroughly enjoyed my time because I was in England. I met my wife there, and we've been married for years. <laughs> And, and it has been a wonderful time. However, when I got out, I knew that I no longer wanted to be a communications technician. So I walked away from a $10,500 reenlistment bonus. And I went back to school. And while at Howard, I discovered that there was a direct appointment program for public affairs officers. By that time, I was working in television as an intern. So I applied for the direct appointment program, got accepted, but I knew that I really wanted to be a full-time active duty public affairs officer. And the only route to that was to request recall. But in order to get recall, I had to request a change of designator, change of designator specialty code. So I changed my designator to unrestricted line, found myself staring at that steam plant anyway. <laughs> I lost 50, up, not 50, I lost 30 pounds while I was up in Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, uh, they sent me back, they sent me to the fleet. I was aboard a reserve can. I worked as uh, a deck officer. I did a little bit of work as, uh, as uh, with the engineering department. Got through that, and lo and behold, I got my request for recall as a regular officer. Then I did something else that a lot of people have never done. I requested a change of designator to public affairs officer. Public affairs active. So anyway, long story short, that's how I got my commission. And as a result of my commission, I was able to, to see and begin to do some of the things I've always been interested in, and that is telling stories. I was on board the Kennedy, uh, in addition to two other uh, reserve destroyers. And it was on the Kennedy where I think my career really took off because when I left the Kennedy, uh, I left with one golden mic, which meant that my, my unit had the best public affairs unit in the fleet at the time. And a couple of months later, I found out that later on, the ship had won a second golden mic based upon what we were doing. But my becoming a naval officer, my experience with the Navy came, I attributed it to my mother and to my brother, my oldest brother. As a matter of fact, when I got commissioned, my mo mama was working at uh, the Navy Ships Engineering Center at the time. And my oldest brother was in town, and he says, Gerald, we need to take mama to lunch. And I don't know if you know where the Navy Ships Engineering Center used to be. It was in Hyattsville. We went over there. I as an ensign, and my brother as a senior chief. You go to board mama for a dime. And she just giggled. And said, oh, Grace, we didn't know you had a naval officer. Oh, yeah, I got a senior chief, too. <laughs> so, so, so all of that, you know, kept me on the track, the road to become, and, and you know, to, for service, in particular, the Navy. So I grew up in a Navy, in, in a Navy influenced environment, even though no one except my oldest brother actually served in the Navy. And Going forward, uh, things were very good until I ran into the Golden 13. And uh, without going too deeply into it now, I stepped on a lot of toes because of that story. And that uh, probably helped to end my active duty career. All right, so you, you've referenced the Golden 13, and we have folks here that probably know who the Golden 13 are, but maybe some folks who don't know who the Golden 13 are.
could you tell us who these gentlemen were in the 1940s? In 1944, uh, the Navy decided that what they wanted to do was to put together a class of a class of Negro officers, and these guys came from all over the country. And originally there were 13 of them. And what they did was that, first of all, what they did was they cut their they cut their class by uh, I think it was like three to four weeks. So instead of going through 16, 18 weeks, they cut it down to 16 weeks or less. What they did was that they made a promise to each other, and the promise was that if one fails, we all fail. And as a result of that, if I'm not mistaken, even until today, they have the highest overall OCS class, Navy OCS class graduating rate of any group of people. Uh, of course, when they were commissioned in March, I think it was 1944, they were sent to the fleet. Uh, there were very few ships that really wanted them. So they went to shore facilities doing all kinds of stevedore associated jobs. But when I met them, I ran into them uh, when I got to Chicago, and I ran into uh, the first one. Uh, Dennis Nelson was the guy who actually kept the story going, but Dennis died the year before I got there. And of course, I ran into Jesse Arbor. Uh I'll pause after this, because there was a, a gent, uh, naval officer, Ike Owens, Ike introduced me to Jesse. And we went down to the McCormick Center we had, and he, Jesse and I went to breakfast. And the breakfast was only supposed to last a half hour, 40 minutes, an hour and a half, two hours later, after <laughs> scrambled eggs, all get cheese and rum and coke. <laughs> I promised him a reunion at sea. <laughs> When I got back to the office and I told my boss, of course I was chewing gum. So my boss didn't know what I was doing. So I was chewing gum and she said, you promised him what? And how do you propose making this happen? I haven't a clue. Make sure it doesn't come out of your budget. Because at the time I was the public affairs officer at Navy Recruiting Area 5. Um, I had friends who were in the recruiting command. Uh, one of the guys who was with me uh, you'll see on the cover, he's the only guy in dress blues. Uh, his, his name is Max Allen. Max is now the vice president for student affairs at uh, Clemson University. Anyway, Max was the guy who ran interference for me in D.C. And we managed to pull the crews off. So one of the things that struck me in reading your book uh, last night was the importance of telling stories. And that's part of the reason I asked all of you here, because you have different stories. Why is it important in your mind that you wrote this down, Gerald, and you, Keith, wrote your story down? What are you trying to do with the stories? And Lori, you've been talking, and John, you've been writing. We're here with African American Month. What are you doing with these stories and these books? Why are you doing what you're doing? For most of you, who know me, and I see, aside from my family, most of you know that I'm in my late 70s. And somebody said to me recently, immortality comes out of the point of a pen. Okay? So I decided that I needed to tell my stories. It started with my first book, The Douglas House, which was mainly about my enlisted time. But in terms of the Golden 13, uh, the lack of information, the lack of general ignorance about the accomplishments of people of color during World War II, because we all sit around and we'll all praise Dr. King, but it was really the brothers and the sisters who came home from World War II who bore the brunt of it. And when, when you sit and you think about what these men did, the Golden 13, and when I first approached the Navy about it, uh, it was sort of poo-pooed. As a matter of fact, the second part of the story, which Denise won't say, uh, in the shadow of the Golden 13, a nice Negro story, that came right out of the mouth of a person who later became admiral and a Naval Academy graduate, too. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so, so, so 
I knew the importance of it, and I'm a history major. And as a history major, I every now and then will run across things that it's sort of like walking into a wall and you're, wow, I just saw something very special. And that was what, that was the impetus behind the Douglas Eyes. Because at 21, 22 years old, I had done something I never expected to do. And I knew it was very special. So when it came to the Golden 13, and I found out that these guys, most of them were, had lived in the Chicago area, and they were known as individuals to Johnson Publication, but the Navy Office of Information saw no benefit to it, saw no value to the story. So, so I went, and I did it, and the gent who gave me the rest of the title, A Nice Negro Story, uh, he came up with that more or less to save his butt because a friend of mine is now deceased, Steve Piles. Uh, he was with NNOA, National Naval Officers Association, in Thai War. I got a hold of Steve, told Steve, hey, this is what's going on. They're going aboard the USS Kidd out of Norfolk. Uh, we're going to hit town on this day. And Steve says, gotcha, man. I'll make sure NNOA, NNOA does a reception for me. Had briefed St. Lance Public Affairs Officer and Chinfo, both here in D.C. and in Chicago, on what was going on, and they pooh-poohed the idea. The Admiral at the time <laughs> ran across the story on NBC News the night before the reception that NNOA threw. So here I am in the BOQ, having been out, having had a couple of beers with some friends because I just left Tidewater, and. He ordered me at 5.30 to come to his office. I got in his office and he began to dress me down. How dare you come into town with these men and you don't come and talk to me? The thing that saved me was that his admin officer had been my boss on board the Kennedy. He says, sir, whatever your PAO told you is a lie. Jerry briefed us. And if he didn't tell you, it's not Jerry's fault. Long story short, Phone call went to Chinfo in D.C. Phone call went to Chinfo in Chicago. Jerry Collins is out here uh, showing up people who are professionals and how dare he do that to us. So that was how things began to go downhill. And as, as this picture on the front of the page, in front of the book, this is an official Navy photograph. One of the things that Max and I got when the crew, when the crew was completed was we got about 15 pictures of us involved in it. And when I saw this picture, and I saw where Max and I, oh wow, you're in the shadow of the Golden 13. <laughs> so, so that's how the title came about. And the second part of it, like I said, came straight out of the guy's mind, who later became an admiral. So, so for me, yeah, it would have been nice if I had gotten kudos, and, 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 and I had my name and lights and all of that. But what's more important to me is the fact that these men are remembered. And I'll share something that will always, always stick with me. The day they were supposed to go home, we got a phone call from uh, John Lehman's office. And John Lehman says, hold them in place. The president, Ronald Reagan, says he wants to meet with them. So we got these guys at the airport in Norfolk. And the flight from Norfolk to here, 20 minutes, 25 minutes max, we held the flight up for an hour, hour and a half. So the people on the plane were really upset. And when we explained to the pilot who they were, the pilot announced over, not the 1MC, but the equivalent of the 1MC on board the airplane. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We apologize to you for our delay flying into New York, uh, flying into Washington, but this morning we had flying with us a treasure of the United States. He's been of the Golden 13, the first black naval officers to come to be commissioned in the United States Army Navy. Those men stood up, they cried, they did everything. And you talk about it. I told you, Lord, I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying not to. But those men, they hugged us, hugged me and Max, and the people cheered. They, it was, if, there was, if there's ever been a time where I felt it was God-inspired and meant to be, 
it was that moment to see these old men, some of them who could hardly walk, you know, break down and cry because a grateful nation had shown them that they were appreciated. And I, I can go on. <laughs> Well, you got a couple of folks here joining you, and I want to say thank you very much. Um, I invited all of you here because you have so much in your head. You have so many stories, and they need to be told. So I'm grateful that you're here and you're telling these stories. Uh, thank you. And we have a couple more. So Keith, you and John have been um, kind of got to know each other by stories, talking about Navy stories. So, do you want to talk to, just share some information about the Navy stories that you've been working on? Yes. First of all, I want everyone to understand here that the only reason I'm here at this table is because John Cordell took an interest in what I was saying and writing. Someone uh, attacked me on LinkedIn. <clears throat> I made a factual statement and they attacked me on it. And John called them out on it. So I connected with John. <clears throat> We started talking, and I sent him a copy of my book, and the rest is sort of history. Uh, I, when I wrote my book, I did uh, a chronology of my own life's experiences in the Navy, and then I overlaid that with what was happening in the Navy, and then I overlaid that with what was happening in the country. So I started way back in the you know uh, early 1900s, and by the time I finished up, you know, it was the end of uh, the end of the 90s. So. Once I laid that all out, I could see all of these interconnections point between what was happening to me and what was happening at the, at the Navy level and then at the national level. So John learned, said he learned some things about the Navy that he didn't know, and he spent 30 years in the Navy. So we started talking about uh, various things, and one thing that stuck out to John was I had a couple of lines in there about um, uh, Admiral Zumwalt and uh, John C. Stennis uh, during the uh, 1973 congressional hearings on permissiveness in the Navy. This was following the race riots on the Kitty Hawk. And it was just a couple of throwaway lines to me. Uh, but John picked up on that and said, you need to write an article about this. I said, I don't write articles. He says, you need to write an article about this. And he bugged me uh, about it for a while. So I finally sat down and I started writing this article about Stannis. And the more I learned, uh, the more upset I got about it. So uh, John got that article published. And then we started writing some other articles together. Uh, I'll give you an example of how one piece of paper can make a change. We wrote an article called uh, DOD's 10-point plan, DEI, Unfinished Business, 10-point plan. And we had uh, 10 points in there, and we had another one uh, with eight points in it. Well, the uh, Navy incorporated three of our recommendations, three of our eight recommendations in that article, saying that they are developing a database to keep track of equal opportunity complaints so that they can track trend data on those and have a, a record of, uh, of those interactions, both for Navy to learn from, historians to learn from, and for the fleet to learn from. So that one article led to the Navy changing policy just a few months after we wrote it. So John and I have been working together for, what, three years now? Three years now? Um, and we have we can see directly some of the, the things we've been pushing. And uh, because of John, um, there's an increased uh, interest in looking at what it's like having a ship named for a lifelong segregationist who was rebuked by the Supreme Court trying to uh, legally lynch three black sharecroppers who had been beaten into confessing, and then confessions were used uh, at their court martial. One of the reasons they're not able to process the men in Guantanamo Bay that were tortured uh, is because of that Supreme Court Brown v. Uh, Mississippi uh, uh, ruling that came out about the Stennis case. So there's a lot of connecting points between what happened in the past and what's happening now. And I could go on a little bit more about that. But John's story is very interesting to me because we were speaking uh, to a group of sailors and officers in uh, Suffolk, Virginia a few years ago and the title of our talk was Mentorship and Sponsorship. They wanted me to come talk about mentor, mentorship. So I'm not coming unless you have income, because I need somebody to make fun of. So they decided to invite us both there, and I said, John, we're not just gonna talk about mentorship, we're gonna talk about sponsorship. And he said, well, what's sponsorship? I said, that's why I'm gonna make fun of you, because you're supposed to know this. So I sent him an article on sponsorship, 
and we got in there and we started talking about those and we demonstrated right there in the room what mentorship looked like and what sponsorship looked like. So we've been setting an example for people both in and out of the Navy on how two people from very, very different backgrounds and disparate uh, experiences can come join forces together and drive change. So uh, having said that, I want John to elaborate a little more on what you said, because he's going to say something that will give me an opportunity to make fun of. Um, well, thanks, Keith, and, uh, and thanks for having me here. I realize I'm a bit of an unusual choice for a, uh, a Black History Month panel, um, but I think you know my goal is to kind of show that it's for everybody, right? It's not, uh, it's not, it's American history, and uh, there's a huge piece of it. Sometimes that gets lost in these sort of monthly celebrations. But uh, I'm going to back up and give you the condensed version of my path because it was pretty simple. Uh, I, I, I didn't have to open any doors. I didn't have to overcome adversity. My, uh, my doors were open for me. My big challenge was, which open door am I going to walk through? Uh, my mom taught uh, at a private school so that I could get free tuition to attend. Uh, I drove to that school in Rome, Georgia, which is a, uh, uh, a very southern town. Um, most of the white uh, people lived on one side, the black population on the other side. My school was on the other end. And so I drove my little National Armor Station wagon with a Confederate flag on the license plate and an Epoor Possum sticker. Uh, through the, the, the poorest sections of town, completely oblivious to the thought that that might be offensive to somebody, right? Um, and uh, my dad was a, a veteran, 30-year Mustang. Um, I was 18. He said, son, you got good grades. Um, you're not living at home. Um, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know. I thought I was living at home. And he said, well, 500 bucks a month, eat dinner with the family every night, and uh, be home by 10 p.m. And I said, I think I'll join the Navy. And, uh, and so he, I had no idea where the Naval, my dad was a Mustang, so the Naval Academy was not a thing. Um, but he basically put that package in front of me and said, you can leave the house when this is in the mail. Uh, so lo and behold, I get accepted to the Naval Academy, uh, which I didn't even know where it was. I'd never been there, but it was free, and it wasn't Georgia. And uh, so I go up there. Uh, my first report card from my, uh, my squad leader was that uh, Midshipman Cordell is probably the worst midshipman I've dealt with and is not suited for naval service and should seek employment elsewhere. Um, I called my dad, the 30-year Mustang, Vietnam vet, and I told him this story, and I said, Dad, I think I screwed up. I think I need to come home. And uh, I'm waiting for him to tell me what to do, and he goes, you're an adult. Make a decision. And, uh, and so 30 years later, I retired as a captain, have a command two warships, and, uh, and, and that's when I met Keith. Um, and I guess my point is that it wasn't until I met him, and I hear this from a lot of my peers, the, the white men that I talked to, well, I spent 30 years in the Navy, I didn't see racism, I, I didn't see sexism. Um, and I kind of come back and say, well, dude, you're a white man. <laughs> Nobody was putting it in your face. And so uh, Keith's, Keith's book hit me like a punch in the gut. Um, and the turning point for me on the Stennis was, uh, if you go to Wikipedia and you Google John C. Stennis, there's a new guy serving aircraft carriers, fellow new, and, uh, and he, he, you hit uh, John C. Stennis, he supported the Navy, he did a lot of things for the Navy, but he was a segregationist. Um, so I called Keith and I said, uh, so Keith, it, it, is a segregationist a racist? And he went like this and said, imagine the irony of you asking me that question. Um, and that was the beginning of a long education um, that, uh, that re resulted in a couple of articles between the two of us. Um, some of them are in the Navy record now um, as uh, pointing out that we have an aircraft carrier named for someone who if they had their way, um, there would be no black people in the Navy and certainly no officers. And so uh, we've tried to make that as public as we can. Uh, but I write articles to give a voice to some folks that maybe don't want to speak up or can't speak up. And uh, sometimes uh, I can get in a room that Keith can't, and sometimes he can get in a room that I can't. And so we work together on that and, uh, and try to bust down some doors. But uh, it's been a great relationship. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Okay, well, Lord, you've been doing a lot of speaking. And, and you. I remember this, the talk you gave last year. So uh, last year was the 75th anniversary of the desegregation order that President Truman issued. And we invited Lori to come. And he had some pretty powerful statements then and now. So you, you want to talk about your advocacy and, and kind of how you've been telling stories? 
Absolutely. So um, I'm working on a book. I've only been out six months. I needed some time to let things flush and you know get get back to normal. Um, but really, I started telling my story um, because I think oftentimes people who look like me get forgotten. And uh, I was telling Denise, we had a conversation, and I said, one of the things that stuck with me most when I was an ensign, um, we had a speaker come and he said, hey, if you're less than 25% of the population, you don't matter. And he didn't mean that in a negative way. What he was trying to say was, make sure that your voice gets heard. So I have been less than 25% of the population for the Navy on so many levels. Black, woman, nuclear engineer. Um, graduated from an HBCU, right? And honestly, I started telling my story because my story had not been told. But my story is not the only one, right? So my husband, he always says, oh my gosh, you need to, you need to brag on yourself more, right? And I'm also from Georgia, and I'm like, I don't, that's not what I do. I don't brag on, oh no, we don't brag, we don't brag. Um, but he said, you know, take a step back and look at the things that you have done for the Navy. And so I did. And I said, you know what? I'm tired of people. There are people out there taking credit for what I have done in the Navy. If you hear representation matters, I was the first one to say that. OK, maybe the third person to say that. Um, there's somebody else out here who's claiming that. It's not his. It's not his. It's mine. <laughs> um, but I also wanted to share the stories of black women black nuclear engineers in the United States Navy. I call us the Navy's very own hidden figures. Nobody realizes that we exist, right? And at one point, there were five of us who graduated from nuclear power school at the same time. And everywhere we went, people called us critical mass. So for the non-nuclear engineers, right, when the reactor goes critical, it's not a bad thing. That's actually what's supposed to happen. Right? And there's some calculations and mass associated with that. So our nickname became Critical Mass. Um, and people would stop, they would stare, we've got pictures. No one believed that we actually existed. And what's crazy is there were five more before us. Um, and since I started doing, I was also a recruiter for nuclear engineers. Um, there have been a few more after us. But no one believes that we exist. And it is so important that we are out here telling our stories, um, saying what we have done for the Navy. You know, one of, two, two things that I'm extremely proud of besides being a nuclear engineer. One, I was recruiting in Millington, and like you said, there's no black Navy and there's no white Navy. I was told there is a black Navy, there is a white Navy, and there is no room for black officers in the nuclear engineering program at the recruiting headquarters, right? I'm a nuclear engineer from Spelman College. What are you talking about? I am standing in the diversity, equity, and inclusion office, and you are telling me that there are no images of people like me on these recruiting brochures because there is no market for black people in the nuclear Navy? Like, maybe I'm confused, but this is your job, so fix it, right? And actually, they decided to use my image. I, that is not what I was saying. <laughs> I was saying, pick one of us, you've got some to choose from, but make it relatable. Make sure that representation matters. So now, I'm still used on brochures. People don't realize I've actually been promoted three times since then. Um, and I'm also on the recruit station doors and folders. If you ever go to a Navy recruit station, the black girl on the folders and on the door, that's me. Um, also, one of the things I accomplished right before I retired, I got the Navy writ large to change policy, to change language when it came to our regulations. Right? They asked me to sit a uniform board, that on them. Uh, I had a great time. Um, but, you know, the phrase complimentary to the skin tone. I'm not sure anyone had ever said, hey, that's racist, I'll stop. Like, regardless of how you try and spin it, that is subjective and that is racist. And it has been unfair to black and brown people since it has been written down. So I was able to convince upper leadership that that needed to come out. They, they touted 
that there were only a few places left in our regulations where we used it. Well, most people don't realize the regulations is over 500 pages long. We only get past, I don't know, chapter three. But think about what that did to sailors who look like me, right? You can't wear a certain fingernail polish because it's not complimentary to your skin tone. You can't have a certain hair color because it's not complimentary to your skin tone. Well, who is making decisions on what is complimentary and what is not complimentary? And what is your idea of, let's be honest, what a black person looks like, right? So let's start there. In your mind, what does a black person look like? And if someone is outside of that box, are they wrong? Or are you wrong? Do you need to expand the way you think? And I know nail polish and hair color seems like such a small thing, but imagine when all you want to do is come to work and complete the mission and do your job and be appreciated, but no one can look past you because you decided to wear pink fingernail polish today and your skin is brown. I legitimately had upper leadership tell me that I should wear brown, leader, brown fingernail polish because the color of my skin was brown. How am I supposed to work in that environment every day? But I did that every day for 20 years, having to be concerned with, oh my goodness, if I wanted to have red hair today, or purple, or whatever. Everything that I had done was getting boiled down to fingernail polish, or your style of hair, or whatever. It was, it was ridiculous. So, Thankfully, I was able to make that change so that future sailors can come to work and they can just be sailors and they can be appreciated for the work that they are doing and what they are contributing to the mission. So that's why I tell my story. Well, I want to say thank you because I remember the, the, uh, the fingernail polish debate from my days on active duty in the 90s. And, and yes, you're right. We were judged by the color of our nail polish. So I want to say thank you. We've been talking now, and I've been asking lots of questions, because I do that, but we have lots of people in the audience, too. Do folks in the audience have questions for us? Because I know I'm not the only inquisitive person here in the room. Oh, I knew I was going to get ahead of the Navy, the Department of Defense, or anything like that. Right. Uh, but I do want to know, um, what is your reaction to the current kind of pushback against diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives? Yeah, that was <laughs> but I kind of wanted to know um, because from what I've gathered from this conversation today, I get the sense that you know uh, that kind of pushback um, with exclusionary rhetoric is also kind of excluding an entire group or groups of people in terms of black and brown. I'm going to take that question. <laughs> surprise, surprise. I think these things go in cycles. I gave a talk back in uh, the, the, uh, January of 2019. And the title of that talk was From the Red Summer of 1919 to the Anxious Summer of 2019. And I laid out in that talk, it's available on my YouTube channel. Uh, it's about an hour and something long. But I talked about the cycles of advancement and regression that happened about every 25 years. In 1919, right here in Washington, D.C., sailors were running around pulling black waiters out of restaurants in Washington, D.C. and feeding them uh, because they were black. World War I was ending. You had black veterans that were being killed as they stepped off of a train. Some of them never made it away from the train station. Um, the man who led the 1898 Wilmington insurrection. Josephus Daniels was a newspaper man. In 1919, he became Secretary of the Navy. And one of the first things he did, or excuse me, was... The first things he did was ban black enlistment of black sailors. And from 1919 into 1934, the Navy would not accept black sailors into the Navy. So that was a pushback from some of the other things that happened. Uh, anytime there's a progression, you're going to have a pushback. Admiral Zumwalt, when he was deep selected over you know, all these other senior uh, uh, officers in the Navy, he was brought in specifically to bring the Navy into the 20th century. One of the most critical people in the United States Navy was uh, Lieutenant Commander William S. Norman. He, was, uh, he said it, put, submitted a resignation letter. There was only maybe 50 black officers 
in the Navy at the time when he submitted a resignation letter. And he listed all these uh, reasons why he was getting out. He'd been on all these diversity boards, equal opportunity, all this stuff. He was just fed up because the Navy wasn't progressing. So Zumwalt said, I want to see this guy. You know, uh, uh, he read his resignation letter and said, I want to see this guy. So Roman walks. He didn't want to see him. But he walked in. He had a list of demands that he was going to make of the CNO, lieutenant, black lieutenant. And so he talks to Zumwalt. And uh, Zumwalt says, I don't want you to get out. I want you to stay with me and help me make things better. So that's what he did. He gave him the list of demands. Zumwalt agreed with all of them. On that day, the Navy decided to let Filipino sailors work in areas outside of the stewards branch. And that changed the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. One of those guys went on to become a Navy, retired as a Navy captain. What I'm seeing right now is just a continuation of the pushback that has happened again and again. The, people, the forces aligned against Zumwalt, the same forces aligned against Admiral Borda when he was fighting for the rights of women in, in the uh, Navy, fighting against the tailhook scandal and all that. Uh, James Webb gave a, spe a speech at the Naval Academy about the leadership not supporting the good old white guys that had always done business this way, got a standing ovation. So all that wound up leading to Admiral Borda committing suicide in 1976, and then we started going backwards again. Excuse me, I said 76, I meant 96. So there's a, there's a, a, a consistent pattern of advancement, pushback, and if the Department of Defense doesn't start pushing back against some of what is happening right now, the anti-DEI initiatives, the anti-affirmative action initiatives uh, in the military academies, that's the last bastion of affirmative action surviving. And if the DOD does not come forth and start speaking about why it's critical to have a diverse officer corps, we're going to wind up in the same place we were in Vietnam. There was an Army general who said, we have solved the race problem in the Army. And a few months later, all these riots broke out, all these race riots broke out, and the Army was tearing itself apart. There's a great book called uh, Fighting Tradition, Fighting on Two Fronts. A guy named George Westheider wrote it about the Army and how the Army had to learn the hard way. We need black officers for our troops to understand that there is a place for them and for these white guys to understand that there are cultural differences between groups of people. So that's a sore spot for me because I think uh, I spoke at a command about the anti-extremism uh, uh, stand down. And when the pushback to that started happening, I waited to see what DOD was going to do. Instead of pushing back as forcefully as General Miley did, what they did was they quietly sort of rolled back the program. So now uh, you don't hear about that anymore. But the level of extremism is growing, and the pushback to the initiatives that have borne fruit is growing, and Department of Defense has to step up and speak up or we're going to wind up right back where we were in the 70s, or maybe even in the 60s. Can I, can I add just a piece of that? Um, <clears throat> who at this table is most likely to push back on the DEI initiative? If you were to look at this table and guess, okay? It's folks, it's folks that look like me, all right? I go on LinkedIn and I post a DEI article, and two amazing things happen. A large number of white males post something about why aren't there white basketball teams? Why isn't there a white history month? Um, and then a lot of my minority friends, black, female, Hispanic, they post a like under my comment. But they don't comment. Why do you think they don't comment? I think there is a fear out there to stand up for yourself. And so, uh, so I try to post stuff like that. I'll tell you, I've lost some friends. I've had people unfriend me. I have people write me on LinkedIn and say, I'm no longer following you because you are uh, too, um, too much, you're too woke. Um, you're too much pushing, you're criticizing the Navy too much, right? Um, and then I go back on a ship and I talk to a black sailor who says, you know, I have a beer um, and people told me I'm disgusted because I have a beer because I have PFB. Uh, I talked to a female. Uh, you know, Denise didn't mention it, but I met her through her advocacy for um, sexual harassment and sexual assault, um, where a female sailor today has a one in three chance of being sexually harassed. Um, and so when people tell me, well, I'm not going to tell my kids to join the Navy because it's too woke, because there's too much DEI, I think it's the opposite. I think it's, am I going to tell my kid to join the Navy if there's a one in three chance that they're going to be assaulted um, or that they're going to be 
this you know call disgusting because they have a medical condition that's the reason we're having problems in my mind is because we look at diversity as divisive um, and not inclusive and so you know me being up here today is an example of that um, of inclusion and that's why I, I joined the National Naval Officers Association and so the Joint Women's Leadership Symposium uh, it's amazing what you learn when you're the only guy sitting in the back of a room of a thousand women talking about the medical parts of, of the Navy so I would just encourage um, everybody in here, no matter what your background is, find somebody that doesn't look like you um, and ask them their story. And, uh, and, and you'd be amazed what you can learn from someone. Um, you, just never, you just never thought about it before. So that, that's my answer to DEI. So first, I'd like to thank you for that. Um, I think that there are not enough people who look like you who are brave enough or know enough to say that, right? And for me, that is the scary part of the pushback for DEI. As you discussed, there's cycles of DEI, there's cycles of DEI. Um, my question is, when will the cycle stop? Right, we've, we've been free for how long now? And we still can't get there because people don't want us there, right? Part of my story is coming from a background of someone who actually never should have made it in the Navy, right? Because let's be honest, there are certain groups of us who were born into a society where we were meant to be enslaved forever. So how do you, how do you fight that backlash against people who still don't want us to be free, right? So when do we get more allies, like you, John, who will step up and say, you know, no, this is, this is incorrect. Let's change how we think about things. Let's associate that pushback with danger because for some of us, that's what it is. When you are pushing back against who I am and what I represent, it becomes dangerous for me, right? One in three, I'd, I'd say it's probably one in two. That's just me. Um, it's sexual harassment, sexual assault, racism, sexism, colorism. These are words that we are afraid to speak in the Department of Defense. It needs to stop. Instead of us following society, we need to be leading society. That's what we're supposed to do as military members, right? We're warriors. We're the golden city on the hill. We need to be leading society into a better realm and not just following along with what everyone else and what the rest of society is doing so we can stop putting sailors, soldiers, airmen, Marines guardians in danger because ultimately pushing back on DEI, that is the problem that we are creating. We are creating hostile and dangerous environments for the minority populations. If, if I may, uh, personally, it's frustrating. It is very, very frustrating because what you have, in addition to having allies like John, there's a need for an awakening within us. I attribute what happened to me to the fact that, as my oldest brother said, there's a guy who was in San Francisco in the California area who retired as, I believe, a three-star. He did the initial input or, or intake on my discrimination case because when I left Area 5, my boss, recruiting Area 5, my boss had managed to rid himself of all of his black and female officers. When my brother first heard it, and remember now, he was a guy from the 50s, and he was one of those guys, even though he was black, he thought that Zumwalt might have been messing up the Navy. And he honestly bought into the fact that they were putting all kinds of people in the Navy and putting gold on them because they wanted to meet a quota. But then he and I had a conversation, and I don't mind sharing it with you. I told him, I said, how could I be so screwed up if we came out of the same birth canal? <laughs> and he said, what did you say? I said, one of us hit our heads, and I don't think it was me. <laughs> and he says, I don't know how to deal with that. So I gave him my package, and he read my package. He said, I can tell you what happened. There were guys who were afraid to step up and say what needed to be said 
because it could have damaged their career. And if you read my book, <laughs> you'll know that one of them, uh, one's still alive, the other one's dead. I got a phone call because I managed to, to meet Admiral Borda, and Borda decided he was going to look into what happened to me. Uh, and I, I felt really personally hurt when Borda committed suicide. But, and the reason why was because I realized that to some degree, Borda was facing the same kind of environment I was facing, where people did not believe he belonged where he was, and he should not have been touching the things he was touching. And, and I think that made Borda a little bit timid in terms of what he did, and uh, God rest his soul, he committed suicide. But there are too many of us you know, who look at the status quo and think that that's the only way it can be. And, and um, I have a meeting coming up with, uh, in a way, and I'd love to talk to Enzo because once upon a time I used to talk to them too. Uh, I, I, I think that my book is going to get back to one of the guys that I'm making reference to because this man had been to my house when he was in the hot plant in Great Lakes. He even kissed my wife. He patted my kids on the head. He told me how wonderful it was to see a brother like you and go. But then when the case came before him, he did nothing with it. And you'd be surprised how many of us will sit back and say, oh, well, it couldn't have hurt that bad because I didn't feel it. So, so, so there, there's a lot of work. And, and John, you need to know this too. I, I'm going to digress. If it hadn't been for you ordering him, he wouldn't have ordered me to write my book. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the club. Yeah. So, Lori. <laughs> no, noted. I'll be, I'll be noted. Working. I'll be and, and, and really, really, I mention that because the value of association, the value of influence, and as you sat there and talked about fingernail polish, you know what ran through my mind? How many times have I worked in public relations, media, and the like, and you have to tell the guy, you get your, you get your light balance off of the darkest person in the room. <laughs> you don't get your light balance off the white guy. But invariably they would, and then you got some black guy, or Filipino for that matter, you know, with shiny, shiny eyes and, and dark skin. They said, they don't take pictures well. You don't know how to shoot well. That's what the problem is. And, and it is a re-education. And, and, and it permeates society from fingernails to taking photos. I have a question up here. Dave, did, did you get a question on the other side of that board as well? Can you speak up, please? Here's a question on the other side of Mike Borda's leg legacy. Admiral Borda had proposed when he was early on in CN, in his tour of CNO, and I covered. The, I was working at the time. I left Navy time, so it was probably Naval Forces British magazine. That any officer fails to get warfare qualification on their first try is not to be allowed to access into the Naval Reserve. If you look at the statistics for who this would have affected, it would have been very interesting on a color-wise basis. Wiser heads or other heads in the Navy stop this as it. Uh, if I'm sounding personal, yeah, I'm a retired commander because of some irregularities, to say that, put it mildly, by my first CEO on the watch bill. Never was uh, in the pilot house. I was always uh, engineering or CIC. So how do you square this with Admiral Borders? Okay, if I take, I think Admiral Borda was under a tremendous amount of pressure. I'll give you an example. In 1988, uh, CNO, Admiral Tross put out a, uh, two articles. It was in Navy Times, or excuse me, New York Times. One said that there was widespread bias and discrimination against blacks in the Navy. And then in October, another one came out and said there was widespread bias against blacks in promotion in the Navy. 
The reason they knew the bias existed is because they went around and interviewed white officers about how they felt about black officers. So the Navy is saying that you have this widespread bias and promotion. They put out, and Border was a CNP there. They put out this uh, report, had 78 recommendations. And in 1989, the Navy had 156 discrimination complaints, and they substantiated zero of them. So you have widespread bias and discrimination against blacks, but you can't find one single case of discrimination in 1989, a year later. So the Navy was fooling itself about what they were saying and what they were doing. And what you're saying is absolutely right. There was so much subjectivity in whether somebody qualified as a, uh, got their warfare qualifications. I never had any issues with qualifications because I studied twice as long and three times as hard as everybody else. And uh, I made sure that I knew everything I needed to know. And I was a nerd, I was a bookworm. But there were lots of people who weren't confident. They didn't look around and see anybody that looked like them. One of the things that happened to surface warfare officer school was they didn't have any black instructors, so minority students weren't doing well. Admiral Gene Kendall told me that he said, well, let's look at the staff. And uh, they put a black officer on the staff. All of a sudden, the success rate shot up. They saw something that they could aspire to. So what you can see uh, will give you some indication of what you can achieve. And if you can see it, you can achieve it. But I think Admiral Border was under a tremendous amount of pressure because he was trying to please uh, people that didn't think he was supposed to be there in the first place. You know, Mustang guy, former personnelman. He was a real inspiration to me. I was a first class yeoman, became an officer, and this guy was a personnelman. I thought maybe I could become a captain or an admiral too. But the Navy doesn't even really understand its own history. They don't know, <clears throat> they may know how we got here, but they don't know why. Because there's so much subjectivity that happens you can look at a black officer's fitness report and notice that there are words missing from that fitness report that are not in the white officer's fitness report. I could devise an artificial intelligence program that would tell me I give it 100,000 service records and probably within a 99% accuracy rate it would tell me which one's black. Because certain things are not said for the minority officers that are said for the white guys. So if you don't understand that, you don't understand why these people aren't qualifying on the first go-round, and if so many of those people just happen to be black, well, either they're inferior or there's something wrong with the system. Because percentage-wise, they should, they should fall out just about like everybody else. So the Navy really needs to look at the subjective part of both evaluating performance and promotions. Because <clears throat> report, report came out uh, just a few months ago said that there's widespread bias and discrimination in military justice against black people. They went back and studied decades and decades worth of studies. And black people have been punished more harshly than white people for decades. And they determined that it was because of bias and discrimination by supervisors and junior officers. Once you know that, um, you can start taking action. The Navy just announced last year that uh, men assigned, well, people, personnel assigned to a ship that is not in an operational capacity can refuse captain's mast at NJP. So that means they have to meet the, the uh, court martial requirements to be held accountable. My father went to captain's mast for inciting a riot on board a naval vessel in 1973, the same the year after the Kitty Hawk riots and all that stuff was happening. Because he was assigned to a vessel, he had no opportunity to demand a trial by court martial. He died before I could ask him what happened. I didn't even know it had happened until 30 years after he was gone. But I thought, what in his life <clears throat> made this man who was identified as the best petty officer ever to serve in the deck department on the ship that he was last assigned to, what would make a guy like that be brought up on charges of trying to incite a riot? He's probably just speaking up for his men. And uh, inciting a riot is just like disrespect. It's whatever the captain said it was. You know. If you look at me sideways, there were men and women, men mostly, that got three days bread and water for reckless eyeball or, or uh, contempt without saying anything. There's a, there's a bunch of good books out there about that. I won't say anything more, but the subjectivity part is the hardest part because it's difficult to get, pe get people to understand that you are, in fact, discriminating against people that don't look like you. It's a subconscious, they've proven this again and again. Subconsciously, black people 
black men in particular, are, are viewed with fear. And fear and anger are very closely related. And uh, so that's part of the problem, the subjectivity part. And I don't know how you adjust for that or how you fix it, but it is a problem. I'd like to, to add something to that. Um, what happened to me, I went from being from 1% fitness report to a 5% to a 30% to uh, a 10% to a 10%. The 5% and the 30% were given to me, and I don't know how many of you really understand what I'm saying, but it's... But the guy who gave me the 5%, his explanation was, I don't give excellent fitness reports until you prove. And I said, well, what about your predecessor who just left last month? Uh, she never really knew how to evaluate people. And the person he was making reference to used to be, used to be the second in command at uh, OCS. So I figured she knew something about evaluating people, okay? Now, when I filed to get my fitness reports removed, the 10%ers the were written by Chen Fo. I'll tell you that up front. And Chen Fo, they had their own program. They did what they wanted to do, even though the man who evaluated me, whom I worked for on a regular basis, made me the deputy for community relations. Now, I'm the dirtbag who walked in, but I'm supposed to be the deputy for community relations, working with the, uh, the Blue Angels and, and the performance teams and, and getting speakers and that kind of thing. When the record, I, my attorney and I challenged it because there was supposed to have been a person from EEO involved in the investigation. What we found was that that person was there, but even though an accusation had been made, but it wasn't a formal accusation. I don't know how you make it a formal and an informal when you say the guy is a bigot, okay? And you give examples, but that's what they said. So they decided that what they would do would be to remove the worst of the guy, the guy who gave me the 5%. Yeah, I mean, the 5% the fitness, yeah. They removed the worst of the fitness reports, the 30%, but they could not say, and this is in writing, we don't know when he began to not be able to fairly assess you. And I said, wait a second, come on. He wrote me a 5 and then he gave me a 30. What else do you need? And then the thing personally, one of his last letters to the board, vocabulary, Jerry Collins has always impressed me as being a little bit dilatory. I don't believe this. I really don't believe this. Dilatory is one of those words, number one, you don't use on a regular basis. And it's fraught with all kinds of hidden, you know, insinuations. And, and I go back to my attorney and he says, you attacked it, Jerry. I don't know how to say it what you have already said, because now you're asking people to challenge people based upon what John was saying. And that is, how do you challenge people based upon their prejudices and, and without actually saying the prejudice? But that's one of the things that, going back to Borba, okay? Um, I had personal conversations with him. He promised me he was gonna do things. And like I said, uh, when he committed suicide, I damn near cried because I understood then what he was going through, but it didn't really come out until after his death, what he was going through. And, and like you said, I loved the man because he was a Mustang, okay? And, and I took pride in being a Mustang. I'll share something else with you too. If you want to take a look at the minority officer sessions from the time uh, Zumwalt issued the order that you will have more minority officers go out 10 years, go out 10 years when those guys should have been making lieutenant commander and see what the drop-off rate was. 
half of them, if not three quarters of them, had dropped out at the lieutenant level. So they weren't there when it came time to make a lieutenant commander. And, and I've seen the reports that he has made reference to. One of them I put in my package and went over their heads. Anyway, I can go on. No, because it's, I have hope because uh, I know what my, my four parents invested in this nation. I have hope because I still have people on active duty who are chiefs, senior chiefs, officers in life who, who believe in what we profess to believe in. And, and that's the thing that makes me, you know, really, really, makes me want to be here. So they drop out, or were they a strike? Hey, Dave, we're running a little over, but I'm going to have you answer the question. Um, so for folks here in the audience, the, the title of this conversation was with Pathways of Service. And in a couple years, the Navy is going to celebrate 250 years. It's 250 years of Pathways. And we were very lucky today to hear about four Paths in 250 years. And again, the reason I had all these folks come up is they've been writing about this. And I am lucky. I am so lucky to work at the Naval History and Heritage Command because I get to work above a library where people tell their stories and talk about their past. So I wanted to say thank you to the folks here on the panel for sharing your story about the path that you took, for writing about the talking about the path, for answering questions about the path, and for everybody here in the audience, thank you for listening about the past, because again, 250 years, this is amazing, so thank you very much for coming. Yes. I don't say it, I gotta give a huge no. shout out to Paul Perry, Hello, Paul. Oh, where'd Paul go? <laughs> and David Barker, because these guys are the masterminds of doing this. They do an amazing job. This is a team effort. So I, again, I just want to say thank you to everybody for coming today. Thank you. Thank you.